that there is the, the title. So there's surprisingly serious uh, science of laughing baby. Um, and it's, um, it's serious because everything has to be serious enough in order to get, uh, to get funding. And it's su surprisingly serious because um, it's, it's laughing baby. And, um, it, it's a, for me, it was a completely overlooked thing that this is one of the defining characteristics about babies, but that had been almost completely ignored by, by scientists. And, and for me, that was one of the, the very surprising things about, about this. So the, the aim for this evening is I'm going to tell you um, a little bit of sort of biological background as to why laughter is an incredibly important thing um, generally. And I will then tell you about a, a survey we did collecting data from uh, parents all over the world, what makes their babies laugh. And I'll finish with um, a range of different um, studies that we've been trying to do in the laboratory to bring uh, laughter into sort of a proper scientific framework. Um, and all the way through this, I want you to keep in mind a quote from this guy, which is, is not Nigel Farage, this guy <laughs> on the other side. Um, this is uh, Victor Borge, a, a musician and comedian, um, who says one of the most um, insightful and amazing things about laughter, that laughter is the shortest distance between two people. And I want you to keep that in mind all the way through the talk, because um, I think that is absolutely the key to, to what laughter is all about. Um, so, just in case you don't know what a laughing baby looks like, <laughs> Uh, we should probably we start. <laughs> Evan. <laughs> Seems like that would be an interesting thing for us to research. So I think it's time for us to start you know, seeing well, what is the baby getting out of this? Why are they laughing? And I think it follows on nicely from Katarina's talk about baby's sense of curiosity. Um, and um, so I thought I'd, I would uh, take a chance to study this. So now, who, who hands up who hasn't seen this video? Okay, that, oh, that's, that's quite surprising, okay, uh, because 81, uh, 815 million people have seen this video, until Gangnam Style came along, this was the, the most popular video on YouTube, it's called Charlie Bit My Finger, I'm not going to play it for you now, um, but part of its popularity is that this little chap here, Charlie, and his mischievous face when he bites his brother's finger, uh, his brother less impressed, but um, it's, it has a, a, a universal appeal that people all over the world um, are amused and entertained by this, um, and that's an, uh, yeah, another key aspect of, of, of um, the fact that the babies are laughing, but we really respond to it. We can't help but respond um, to, to, to baby laughter. Um, and then um, this baby here is seven seconds old. Um, so this baby has just been born and is already delighted to be here in the world. Um, they actually now can do um, ultra th four, what's called a 4D ultrasound um, of a baby's video recording of babies in the womb using ultrasound. And they already see the, the full smile reflex and the full genuine smile across the face of a baby. In a womb. So it, it's present from the very beginning of life. Um, uh, and and what, why is it there? What is it for? So before I sort of start to answer that about, about babies, let's take a, a step back and ask a, a sort of a, a broader question. It's like, when, 
did animals of any kind start laughing? Um, and so for this, I want you to, to start off, um, uh, I want you to sort of try and guess. So what I want you to do is, if everybody has their hand raised, I want you to lower your hand at the, age, the time when you think laughter actually started. So if we end up with anybody with their hand left as we go further and further back into time. But everybody start with one hand up. Was it only a mere 10,000 years ago, the invention of agriculture? Probably <coughs> it was before that. How about you know, 50 to 70,000 years when humans were behaviorally modern, the first time you could actually see genuine, uh, completely anatomically normal humans? No, it's probably earlier than that. So how about 200,000 years? Mitochondrial Eve. Um, possibly this is when language first started to, to appear. We don't really know, of course. But that's our earliest common, our sort of most recent common ancestor of everybody in this room. Um, so, as a, as a universal thing, maybe that's the point. Or perhaps we could go a bit further back. Maybe Neanderthals laughed. You know, perhaps we think that um, you know that's the point where laughter came. Or no, I don't know. We're, we're, we're sort of scrabbling around and think we don't really know. But two hundred, two and a half million years ago, Homo habilis. The first point where we actually started using tools, walking upright, um, uh, is that sort of a, a measure of sophistication at which point we can, we can start to have a joke and a laugh. Or maybe six million years ago, our, our common ancestor with the, the chimps, the gorillas, the orangutan. Uh, still a few hands up, so let's, let's go a bit further back. Um, 25 million years ago. So. Do all monkeys like to laugh? Old world and new monkeys, uh, new world monkeys, um, diverged 25 million years ago. Is that the point where we, when laughter started? Uh, and it's just Max, baby, with your hands still. Your hands still up? Ah. Half up. So how about? So nobody thinks it would be like 60 million years ago. Our common ancestor with all current mammals, and then really pushing the boat out, maybe 250 million years. <laughs> Uh, well, it's, yeah, why not? Um, so, it's certainly true that um, our, our cousins, the great apes, chimpanzees, orangutans, gorillas, they all laugh. Um, but I would say that actually, um, I'm going to push things back further and say this fellow here is potentially um, the uh, Protoangulatum doni, the common ancestor uh, of all mammals living today. He was basically the chap who survived the crashing of the asteroid which killed the, the dinosaur. Um, and is our most recent common ancestor um, with all of our mammals. Um, see this, this point here. And in particular, it's our most recent common ancestor um, with one animal which we do know laughs. Um, and that is surprisingly rats. As we have listened to an animal's playing, we have heard what appeared to be the sounds of laughter. And uh, we studied these for a couple of years without quite understanding that this might be laughter. And then one day we decided to tickle some animals. And we realized that we had to look at the sounds at a very different register than we can hear. So we uh, obtain these transducers that are called fat detectors that can bring very high frequencies down to our auditory range. And when we did this and we listened in, we could tickle animals and generate a lot of vocal activity that appeared to be laughter. These animals would begin to enjoy our company and they would start to play with our hands and wherever we would put our hands, they would follow it. <laughs> and when we tested these animals to ask whether they were enjoying this kind of activity, the unambiguous answer was yes. So, <laughs> so that is Professor Jack Panzer. He is the most eminent uh, researcher into animal um, emotional behavior. Um, he sort of basically fact founded or rediscovered the field of studying the, the idea that um, animals such as rats have emotions beyond just fear. 
Charles Darwin actually introduced this idea um, you know, 150 years ago, but it's been completely neglected. And in a lot of his work, Jack thinks that it's, it's an uphill battle to get people to take seriously the idea that um, animals have uh, these sorts of rewards and social rewards. So his experiment was not just waving his arm around in the tank. They did very carefully controlled experiments to see if a rat would be rewarded um, for um, being tickled. And they found that it was just as rewarding as any sort of food that they could give the rat. Um, and they also found that the tickling and, and um, this, uh, the, the, the actual behavior that they, they created here by tickling the rat is common in uh, the social play of young adolescent rats. How they, they first discovered it, that they, um, uh, when young, young rats were playing with each other, they would sort of um, uh, rough and tumble play and would be tickling each other, biting the back of each other's neck. And this was, this, this was where um, sort of tickling was evolved and laughter was a, as a response Rat laughter was a, was a call to encourage more of this social play. Um, and it's interesting to, to connect this to not just laughter, but to tickling, because the, um, uh, another important aspect of uh, early, early mammalian behavior is, um, is touch. And uh, um, uh, so, <coughs> Just, yeah, just to reiterate what sort of Jack Pankset was so, um, saying there was that laughter is existing in rats is to encourage to encourage social play, and that tickling is, is as old as, as laughter. Um, but what's important is perhaps that tickling may have been the, the start of this, and there's, there's a remarkable, quite Dickensian experiment where two little orphan rats were taken from their original mummy and then fostered into, into one of two homes. Um, one of these rats was put into um, uh, the care of, of a, a rat who was a very poor mother, who didn't lick her pups, and provides almost no tactile stimulation, and just is not, um, sort of, been bred not as, a, 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 as good at giving care to her, to her infants. Um, and the, the, uh, the brother of, or sister of this rat, or sister I should say, um, was raised by a mother um, who does lick and groom her pups, um, makes sure that they're, they're actually close to her body and can suckle and um, uh, have close skin-to-skin -skin contact. Um, and when these rats, raised in these environments, genetically completely identical, grew up, um, the rats fostered um, to a poor parent uh, grew up with an inability to cope with stress, real trouble with anxiety, and turned out in, in its turn to be a similar parent to the parent it had, it's very bad at um, caring for um, its, own, uh, its own pups. Uh, the brat fostered to a good mother was very good at stress relation, uh, regulation, became a good parent. And it actually went a lot deeper than this, that um, when they looked at the, the, the neuroscience behind this, they discovered that this um, uh, licking and stroking of the skin of the rat was absolutely crucial to the development of, of, of regulatory pathways in the brain between the adrenal glands um, and areas in the hippocampus. Um, and it took them an awful lot of effort to get this paper published in <coughs> neuroscience. It's gone on to become one of the most cited papers in, in nature neuroscience. Um, the foundation of, of much of current research in epigenetics. Um, what sort of is key about that is that essentially um, a mother is completely important to the, the early development of, of most mammals, and certainly of social mammals. <laughs> and that within that, touch is in incredibly important. And why am I telling you this? Well, partly because it's something you really should know, um, but also um, the, the sensors in the skin which respond to this touch are also the sensors which respond um, to tickling. And it's, it's, a, it's a finding in, in um, the upbringing of human infants that skin-to-skin -skin touch is incredibly important very early on. Um, and I like to make the case that tickling is also yeah, a very important thing. So that is our friends the rats.
What about babies? Well, um, unquestionably, babies uh, laugh a lot. Um, and they love being tickled. Um, what can we say about that in sort of more concrete terms? Um, and perhaps before I say that, well, why am I personally interested in researching this? So this, these are my niece and nephew, uh, Taiko and Mirabel. My sister, three or four years ago, uh, Mirabel, um, three years ago now, Mirabel was born. Taiko a couple of years older. Um, so there were little babies in my family. And then this is, uh, is my brother, uh, Max, who is a stand-up comedian. Um, and I was thinking one Christmas of something we could do to get us all together, involved in something. And I was trying to persuade my brother that he should try and make you know, a stand-up show for, um, for babies, for toddlers. Uh, he, being a comedian, he was too cool for that. Um, so he wasn't, uh, he wasn't interested. And it left me to sort of... Uh, think about, well, I'm a, I'm a scientist, I'm a baby scientist, maybe I should just do it scientifically. Um, and actually, this is, for me, uh, a chance to follow in the footsteps of one of my scientific heroes. One of the reasons I came into studying babies at all um, was because of this paper, I don't know if you can read any of that, but it's called An Ecological Study of Glee in Small Groups of Preschool Children. So, um, what this paper did is basically a man went and sat in um, a, a little preschool and spent hours and hours, I think maybe he videoed it, but he spent hours and hours waiting to see one child burst into laughter and see it spread amongst the, the group. And then sort of like uh, Jane Goodall in, in, the, in the forest, recorded the effects of that. Um, it's a wonderful paper um, and it actually won the Ig Nobel Prize in 2001. Uh, hands up anybody who knows what an Ig Nobel Prize is. Okay, not many of you. Um, so the Ig Nobel Prize is uh, it's partly a joke, but it's there to honor research that first of all makes you laugh, and then really makes you think that there is a serious point behind it. And when I read about that 2001, when I first started in Birkbeck back to the undergraduate, um, but this is fantastic. Yes, I, I love this sort of thing. So that was my personal motivation for studying baby laughter. How did we start? We started with an online um, uh, survey where we did three different things. We had a 20-minute long questionnaire where we asked parents all sorts of things about their babies. We asked them for short little field reports of uh, things that they, found, that they found funny. And then we asked them to send them in videos. And almost all the videos you'll see in this talk have been sent in for, by parents um, as part of this project. So, so Toddy there at the beginning uh, was one of the, the participants in this. Um, because uh, if, without any real scientific research, this seemed like a good place to start, to get um, genuine field reports of what is laughter like out there for, for parents and for their babies. Um, so. From the questionnaire, we had um, uh, approximately two, two, uh, over 2,000 people that started filling it in. Only about 1,400 of them actually finished it, which, if you think about the fact they've got a small baby demanding on their time, it, it's quite understandable they may have got interrupted. And we've got people from uh, 60 different countries, including, if you look down there at the bottom, Vatican City. <laughs> um, I, I have no idea what the story behind that is. Um, but primarily from the UK, but from a, a large number of places all over the world. And we, we had 25, 25 twins in the study as well. So, so what did we discover? Well, the first thing we found is that laughs and smiles start very, very early in life. Um, the first smiles um, are within the first month by the you know, vast majority, you know, and, um, by one and a half months on average. And then uh, the first laugh um, some people are reporting that in the first month or two, and the majority, by three months, the baby is laughing. Um, so laughter is there from the, from the beginning. And it, it, there's been this sort of myth that, oh, early laughter and early smiles, they're just trapped wind. It's not really a baby genuinely laughing and smiling. Um, I, I think that that sort of underestimates what parents know about their own babies. This is the reporting of, of, of parents, and obviously parents 
are slightly biased about their own babies, but they know them better than anyone else. And so when they see a smile, they know whether it's a smile or trapped wind. And so I really believe these data that, that smiling and laughing is there from early on. And we've got some proof. So this is, this is Jasper. He's nine weeks old. You know what these are? These are your hands. These are your hands. Oh. You know. Yeah. These are your hands. Whoa. So I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that that yeah. really does so. um, <laughs> One interesting thing about that is obviously very young babies don't have much sort of voluntary control over, over their lungs. They can cry, as I'm sure you, you, you're well aware, um, but laughter is a slightly more complicated uh, sort of vocal, vocal production. It involves stopping and starting the air, coming out, ha, 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 um, very rapidly, which is it's actually very difficult to do. And so young babies, when they're laughing, it isn't really quite the same as, as um, own laughing, but it is quite similar to, to chimpanzee laughter, um, who also don't have a huge amount of control over their vocal apparatus. And so it has this same sort of more um, panting and hooting type uh, your hands. Oh, your hands. Oh. What is this though? What is this though? What is this? Are these your hands? Are these your hands? Focus. Pushing parents. Yeah. 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 Okay. It was worth it. Those are your hands. <laughs> so, a party bad uh, <laughs> demanding too much from Jasper. I think, you know, unquestionably that that is uh, a happy baby and that is genuine laughter. Um, so another thing we found um, to slightly to my surprise, actually, uh, we asked how many times a baby's laugh. Um, I, I just think we've got a pointer or not. Um, and so the actual numbers here between 10, 20, and 20 to 50 um, <coughs> were slightly less than I was expecting. This is parental report. <coughs> I do really want to go out and uh, give a baby a little recorder and see how many times we can count in a given day. Um, because I think it will be a little bit more. I actually had one parent who thought the same the next day um, after she filled in her, the study. So I, I don't really know how many times my baby laughed. And she had twins, uh, so, uh, Alexandra in Venezuela. So the next day she decided that she would count how many times her twin laughed. Um, when she got to 500, she stopped counting. Um, so I think. Uh, this numbers might perhaps underestimate the real amount of laughter that babies get to. Um, and one of the things when we get to study this more scientifically will be to sort of find out exactly what that real number is. This, I won't go into too much detail, but this is, we ask parents what they think the main reasons behind the why a baby's laughing at a given moment. The things at the top are things that are more important, the things at the bottom I think are less important. Um, so the, the, the most important things here are a, a response to a pleasant sensation, excitement, and because they are happy. Um, and, um, and then uh, a response to, a, to surprise is sort of the, the next thing. Also important here is that um, uh, it's, uh, it really wasn't the case. So these, these three here at the bottom might seem a bit strange to you. Some of these were actually, so certainly fear, release of... Uh, fear being averted and release of tension were ideas that, that uh, Freud had a uh, hundred years ago about um, 
what might be the cause of, of adult laughter. Um, and certainly parents don't think that's what causes um, you know, infant laughter. And I think we'll see shortly that uh, there's other things which uh, show that Freud was, was on the wrong track here. Um, one, a couple of questions that we asked were, um, what, you know, well, the most reliable way to get your baby to laugh, um, and hopefully you'll, you, you, can, you can predict what, what the answer here was going to be. Um, it's good to see that uh, tickling is there as like this very strong, uh, uh, strongly dominant thing. Uh, and I'll come back to some of the other things a bit later on. Um, but just to give you a little example of, of tickling and of laughter a little bit earlier. Unfortunately, we don't have a video of Cosmo. We've just got this uh, sort of stop motion thing. Uh, um, his mum, Catherine, uh, tickling him and seeing how he reacts. <laughs> And in fact, let's go back to that one, because that's my favourite picture in the whole talk. Um, Cosmo is clearly having quite a good time here. Um, and you know, this, this is you know, three weeks old, and already you know, it's, it's a, a look of happiness on his face. And you know, it, as his mother reports, this, this was what she would have considered laughter. Um, so tickling from very early on elicits laughter. And laughter is present from very early on. Then if we sort of ask a slightly different question as to, well, what are the funniest toys and games that you can play? Um, and again, there's a very strong <coughs> thing that comes out of this um, that by far and away, and this is true across all the countries that uh, responded, uh, that peekaboo uh, is the uh, most popular thing for babies. So um, this is peekaboo, in case you didn't know. Um, and why, why is this sort of so universally um, successful? Um, well, there are, there are two reasons. The first and foremost is that laughter and the, the causes of laughter are ultimately and absolutely sort of uh, essentially social. So laughter is the shortest distance between two people. And peekaboo is the reduced, condensed version of a game which is all about the connection between two people, between you and the baby. Um, you, uh, the baby has your full attention, and the whole game is about when and where you're going to make eye contact. So that's the first reason. The second reason um, that it's successful with babies is that they actually play different versions of this game at different ages. So really, young babies um, don't play this, this game. When they're the, uh, the age of Jasper and uh, Cosmo there, um, it, they, they don't really uh, understand this game. It's, it's only um, when uh, they have some, some uh, a couple of months older that they start to recognize that this is, this is mummy, and they're pleased to see mummy. Um, so that's maybe three, four months old that this game starts to, starts to be fun. Um, as their memory develops, so the very young babies, they, out of sight really is out of mind. So when mummy isn't there, she's, she's forgotten about. Uh, but as memory develops, then um, anticipation can come into the game. So between six and eight months old, babies have some sort of a memory. And when mummy goes away, um, they can hold it long enough in their mind that they um, can expect that she's coming back. And so the game now changes to be one of expectation and surprise uh, as to exactly when that comes. At, at, at 12 months, babies um, and most parents sort of in the room will, will know this is a certain point where babies realize they can make you laugh. Um, and around 12 months is when this happens, and so the game changes again. And now a large part of what the baby gets out of it is the fact that you're laughing with them. Um, and that when you, you know, they laugh so much at, at you coming back that you're laughing too. And that's that, that becomes part of the reward. And as they get even older, to so like uh, 18 months and two years, it can often be that actually they're, they're largely playing it entirely for your benefit. They're playing it um, to humor you. Um, so it, it, it remains, it, 
keeps you know it, its popularity, um, and yet it changes. And all the way along, this is teaching a baby about the most important thing it has to learn in the world. The most complicated thing to understand in the world is other people. And any experience and any interaction you get which teaches you about the, the dynamics and the timing of interacting with other people is incredibly valuable when you've never seen it before. Um, and I've got a little, oh, I'll come back to that. I've got a little, where has he gone? There we go. A little illustration which um, shows, shows this. So this um, is actually a baby seeing himself in the mirror for the first time. And he's three months old, as Frederick from Poland. Um, he's far too young to understand that that is him. Uh, babies don't understand that until they're about 18 months, nearly uh, two years old. Um, and the way we do that is we put a little dot on their, a red dot on their forehead, and we see if they, they touch it and sort of see, that, oh, what have you done to me? Uh, rather than who's that baby in the mirror. So this, Frederick doesn't know this is him, but he knows that there's something unusual about this situation. Um, and just watch and see. Um, and um, actually, no, I'll, I will tell you before that, and then you know what to look out for. But what's weird about seeing yourself in a mirror is that it's completely unlike any other interaction you have with any other human. From the moment we start interacting with babies, we treat it as a conversation, even subconsciously. We, there is a turn taking, there's an automatic pause for a response. So we ask them something, we wait, and even though we know they can't talk, we're always having the dynamics and the timing of the conversation. <coughs> this baby here in the mirror is breaking those rules, and that, I think, is what Frederick finds weird and funny about, about this. So see if you, see if you agree. Very early on, laughter is about social learning. It's about helping you understand other people. Um, so let's go back to where everyone. And that peekaboo is the um, the absolutely condensed form of that. Uh, one other little thing from the from the survey um, that Sigmund Freud was was really wrong. So um, not only was he saying that laughter is about fear of being averted, that was what he was thinking. A large part of um, to release attention in adults, his theory about why children laugh is to do with superiority. They, when, they look, when they see somebody fall over, they laugh because it wasn't them that fell over. Ha, I didn't fall over, but you did. Um, and so it actually, seriously, he genuinely suggested <laughs> that infant laughter is a form of schadenfreude. Um, and um, we, uh, it sounds, sounds strange, but I mean, a lot of, a lot of Sigmund Freud, uh, whenever he was talking about children, he wasn't really talking about children, he was talking about adults. And didn't, I don't think he spent much time paying attention to real children. Um, this is a child laughing at someone falling over. So uh, this is, uh, um, I, I can't remember her name, she's laughing at her twin brother, who, is a, who sort of comes into the picture very briefly and falls over. So just watch out. sense of fairness and a sense of empathy 
Um, and so I think like, the first starting point for this is that she isn't too worried whether she's, she's sort of um, uh, worried that he uh, isn't, uh, isn't injured, and so that when he isn't injured, that then she can run off. But we also ask parents, um, what does, do, how often do the baby laugh when they fall over themselves? And they fall over a lot, but they seem to find that relatively funny. But when do they laugh when other people are falling over? And it was almost never. Um, and again, this is something where there could be a bias in parental reporting. Um, we should perhaps do this in a laboratory without pushing babies over. Um, <laughs> fortunately, they do fall over themselves enough that I could probably do this as a study. Um, so now, brace yourselves for this one. <laughs> So that is laughter's evil twin, uh, crying. They are two sides of the same coin, in my view. You know, laughter, uh, crying exists for a baby to tell you, and to tell you very effectively, to stop whatever is currently happening. It's um, a baby's first uh, and most effective means of communication. Um, they're not happy about something. They can't really tell you what it is. Um, but it's up to you to try and fix it. And this noise is something that we really can't ignore, and we have to fix it so that they'll, they'll stop. Um, cry laughter, I would say, is the reverse of that. That actually, um, when a baby's laughing, um, it's something that they want to continue. They want something that they want you to keep doing. And they can't really tell you exactly what it is they like about what's going on, but they like it and they'd like more of it. And just as we really can't help but respond to crying babies, um, I think it's fairly clear just from your own reactions tonight and from 815 million viewers of Charlie Biting My Finger that we can't help but respond to, to babies laughing and we respond in a way which gives them more attention and gives them more of whatever it was that um, uh, they were interested in. Um, and then sort of, there, you know, our reward for that is this smile and this laughter. And a friend of mine, when we were doing this project, she was telling me about her baby that, um, you know, being a mother, having baby is the hardest thing in the world. It, it's a completely unrelenting and thankless task most of the time, with lots of cleaning up of uh, babies that are usually even more dirty than this. Um, and she said if, if it wasn't for the laughter, she'd have probably thrown him out of the window. Um, <laughs> um, that's not exactly data, uh, but I think it's a very valid point that uh, the laughter is a reward for the parent, and it's um, something that's needed, because being a parent is quite a, a, a thankless task in many other respects. Um, and this uh, this comical little character who uh, may have made a horrible mess, but you can't be angry at because he just looks so ridiculous. Um, <laughs> so getting back to this idea that um, laughter and crying is like part of the same coin, um, let's uh, examine a bit further the idea that laughter has some communicative role. So let's just watch this video. And when, you want, when you're watching this, look out for sort of how the baby not only laughs at what's happening, but really references <coughs> looks to her father, who's doing the um, uh, doing the funny things um, in a sort of a communicative way, as a way to you know, get them to continue. <coughs> Ha <laughs> ha! 
um, that there really was a turn-taking aspect to it. She really was waiting for something to happen before she was, she was making a laugh, and that she was referencing to her, her father when she was doing this. Um, secondly, um, that it was an incredibly rewarding thing when the baby laughed. You know, we were all enjoying it. We sort of had, had that, oh, that's fantastic. And it worked for Daddy. It got Daddy doing very stupid and silly things and kept him doing those silly things. The, the third thing, which is a bit of a mystery, which I've seen in quite a few of these, these videos, um, and we saw just at the last bit there, let's skip, um, is that um, when the baby stops laughing, they stop completely dead. So I think we saw that just in the last few seconds of this video. Uh, I've got a few of them. <laughs> It just you know, got, goes back to as if it never happened. And I've got a few other videos I haven't got time to show you, unfortunately, where that, uh, unless somebody asks me a question, maybe, um, where that, that happens again and again. The babies are laughing, and then suddenly they stop. And uh, it's like, it never even begun. Um, we've seen Frederick. Um, what now about, about baby Thomas, then? So, one other thing here, the baby is in the previous video was, was laughing at something funny that Dad's doing. Here, um, the baby has uh, learned a new skill. It's learned that turning on and off this light switch makes the light goes out. It also, um, and let's warn you, it, turning off the light in this case makes somebody scream. I'm fairly sure it's the Dad that's screaming. Um, but uh, yeah. Here, what we want to see is the baby just delighted at, at this, this discovery. something um, surprising, something funny. Um, and uh, I think this is, a, this is actually what I thought would be the starting point and the most important aspect of baby laughter, that so much of what they would be laughing at would be um, about their, their latest discoveries in the world. And that's what I hoped to, to be able to map out by seeing what the babies were laughing at. And to some extent this was true, um, but uh, all the way through that, the thing that was surprising them the most, the things which was so funny, was other people, and that actually it's the social aspect of laughter that's perhaps more important. But it isn't to say that babies really aren't, you know, aren't social scientists. They really are out there discovering things for themselves by trial and error. It's, um, it's up, you know, nobody's teaching them. They don't even speak English or whatever language yet. They have to teach themselves. And they have to teach themselves an awful lot of stuff. They have to um, learn everything about moving around in the world. They have to learn about you know, how their body acts. They have to learn about the world itself, the objects, space, um, the laws of physics. Um, they have to learn about the things out there in the world. Uh, uh, and that, that these things have names and that they have different categories. That here are dogs, here are cats. Um, people and inanimate and animate objects. Um, and then, of course, people being the, one of the most complicated things about that. Um, not just their emotions, but uh, pointing. Um, and, uh, you know, as we've already said, this sort of sense of, of, of fairness and morality. And um, then 
abstract concepts that you can't even really point to. You've never seen a yes, you've never seen a no, but you have to learn that. Uh, you have to learn all gone, you know, nothing being there. And so many things that it is a constant uh, challenge um, and a, a sense of discovery for these babies. And if they weren't enjoying it, um, then it really uh, you know, it would be overwhelming. And, and yes, to be fair, they do burst into tears occasionally. Um, but a large part of um, what drives that forward is this sense that they want to know, this sense of curiosity. Um, so that, that's the conclusion of like the early part of the work. Um, and three sort of important things to take from that is that laughter is communicative. It, it starts before la language. Um, laughter is, a, a, above all else, social. It's about a connection with, with another person. Um, and that this laughter is happening while babies are learning things about the world. Um, and that's, that, those are conclusions, well, those are actually sort of theories rather than conclusions. That's, that's what I learned from just watching lots of videos and asking lots of parents about their babies. This, this hasn't been terribly scientific yet. And so this second part, which we'll go through a bit faster, is about how we've tried to, to look at this in the laboratory. Um, and um, I'll just go through a few of the things we're doing. Um, I won't spend too much time on details because we've only really just started this. We're actually, um, any day now we will hear if we're going to get a, a big grant to spend the next three years tickling babies. And fingers crossed. Uh, but these are the, the beginning of how do you move from uh, what seems like a nice idea and seems to be supported in, in lots of YouTube videos to studying things in the lab. And here, Birkbeck has been very helpful. Um, one of the first sources of data we have is from the Institute of um, uh, uh, Fam Family Studies, a uh, study of children, families, and social issues, who for many years have been custodians and running it's called the Families, Children, and Child Care Study, which has been following 1,200 children from three months old. Um, and has a large range of information about their family background, um, the childcare they had, their, exam their school results now that they're five and six and eight. Um, and one of the things they have is a, a 10 minute video of structured mother-child interaction um, at 11 months old. And, and Max there at the back for his uh, student project has um, been the first person to go through and code the amount of laughter in, in some of those videos. And then we can then use that as a predictor for uh, measures like uh, lang uh, um, uh, the, student, the child's uh, vocabulary at later points and other aspects of development. In our actual project, we, we, we didn't actually manage to code a large number. We only managed to code what, 40 babies. Yeah. So um, we've only got trends in, in the data so far, but we hope to sort of look at that in a bit more detail um, if we get the funding. Um, second study we've, we've done is, and now you can, you can have a go at this too, um, you, Sophie Scott over at UCL has done this experiment with adults and children. Uh, one of the, these are, this is the same person <coughs> laughing and then faking their own laughter. Um, and so let's... <laughs> seems to be going in this direction. Yeah, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. That's actually Sophie Scott herself, uh, real and fake laughing. Um, and um, she, they tested this with children down to uh, just under 10 years old and people up to 16 and 17. Um, people are able to tell this um, you know, quite reliably. Well, interesting fact is that you also ask how funny they think, find this. And that dra drops off, dr fake laughter drops off dramatically uh, uh, once you stop being a child, which is uh, perhaps sad or perhaps wisdom, we don't know. But real laughter stays being funny, um, even into, uh, into your 70s. Uh, and we thought we'd try this 
with 18 month old children. Um, so the way we're going to do this is that we play the sounds from a speaker behind the, the child's head. There's two people sitting opposite uh, the child who don't react in any way. Um, and we see uh, how, they, how they respond. Are they going to turn around more to one or the other? Um, uh, and I'll just show you a little bit of an X brief except for this. You probably won't hear. <laughs> That second one is the real laughter. The first one, the first one wasn't. Um, not really sure what's going on. And actually, um, we, in the 13 children we've tested, there was no um, strong effect in this. So it's quite a real variation as to whether they turned around or not. Um, might be that we've just got a very small sample. This was just a pilot study. Uh, maybe we need uh, to do it in a slightly different way. Second thing we've, we should look at is, is laughter contagious in young children? So, uh, oh, my keyboard is frozen now. Oh, there we go. Um, so there is research um, showing that uh, laughter is certainly contagious in, in adults and children. Um, and research done here um, at Birkbeck uh, uh, by, uh, at, at Sushi uh, and... Um, uh, and uh, uh, colleagues found that actually yawns, dogs will catch yawns from humans. And so yawning is so contagious that it actually crosses species barriers. Um, so we thought we would just have a parent and, a, and an experimenter sitting opposite a child, and we both take turns to yawn and to smile. Um, and we'll show you just a dad uh, uh, to yawn and to laugh, sorry. Basically, there was only one yawn in the whole baby, so none babies are, don't get contagious yawning, only one yawn in the whole experiment. Um, and basically, parent and experimenter caused them to laugh just as much. And there was, there was a fair amount of laughing in the yawn condition. What's interesting, though, is if you look at this graph, as to how much the baby was looking at one person or the other. In the laughing condition, they look almost exclusively at the person who is laughing. In the yawning condition, um, they really are looking between the two people. And I refer back earlier to the idea that laughter and in the game of peekaboo is about holding this connection with someone. And this, this data seems to sort of support the same idea. Um, and uh, so we'd say here that laughter <coughs> directed at the baby in this particular case is capturing and holding the baby's attention. Um, and the babies you are coming, uh, but they do, they are laughing, they're finding something funny about the, the adult uh, yawning. Um, now, our very final experiment, which again was run as a student project by uh, 
by Charlotte, Sarah and Lenka there in the back. Wave, please. Yeah. Um, so for their, their project, um, we were interested in um, what's the difference between laughter and humour? Um, and how much of laughter is social as opposed to about humour? Um, so what we did is we got a, a, what we thought was a funny cartoon. Does anybody know that? Bernard, Bernard the Bear. Um, and we got children to watch this under three conditions. So they'd either watch it on their own, in groups of two, or then in groups of six or eight. And we'd have a little camera and we'd film their response and, and uh, count the number of laughs that they, they each made. We'd also ask them at the end of each video, how funny did you think that was? Do you think that was not funny, quite funny, or very funny? Um, when we ask them that, um, you'll see this is their responses when they were watching it on their own, in pairs or in groups. And actually, there's, that's, that pattern of responses is, is not significantly different between each condition. They, the majority of children found it funny, very funny, and they found it very funny whether they were watching it on their own or in groups. What is different is the number of smiles and laughs. So now, counting the laughs and smiles that the children made, um, looking at, at laughs, you'll see when they're watching it on their own, there are almost no, uh, no laughs and very few smiles. Um, and and uh, yet, as soon as there's just one other person there watching this with you, um, that goes up dramatically um, in, both ter in terms of both laughter and smiles. Um, and again, it sort of shows that a lot of what laughter is about is not about what's funny, it's about sharing that what's funny with other people. So that's sort of all the research that we've done so far. So we, we've got some uh, uh, grant in, hopefully doing some more. Um, I'll just finish by sort of maybe sharing a few lessons that we can all take away that we can learn from these babies. So um, the first thing uh, is uh, that the babies are um, they're laughing and they're happy. And, and why is this? Um, a large part of this sort of seems to back up research done with adults that the way to be to be happy and the uh, the way to sort of um, get the most out of what you're doing is to constantly be challenging yourself. So uh, Mikhail, uh, she said uh, went around asking adults all over the place, finding the people who were happiest in whatever they were doing, whether they were uh, in a very repetitive job or doing something very complicated, found people who, whatever they were doing, did it with joy and really uh, uh, were happy doing it. They found that they had this thing called flow, that they could really get involved and really focused on what they were doing. And the reason they could do this is because they were constantly <coughs> challenging themselves but, uh, so that they weren't bored, uh, but not challenging themselves so much that it would be too tricky. So they were, they were constantly on the, on the, the verge of learning new things. Um, babies do this automatically because they have to. They can't, uh, if things are too difficult, they, they have to move away from it. Uh, but I think it's something which, um, the fact that babies are more, um, more happy is related to the fact that they are constantly learning new things. Um, second sort of related thing is that babies are little Zen masters. When they are doing things, they are 100% absorbed in it. They are completely focused on whatever is in front of them. And that, that is an absolutely essential part of you know, getting the most out of whatever it is you are doing. Um, the other clear thing uh, about laughter and happiness that we can learn from babies is that you should share it with people. And the reason that parents and babies laugh so much is because they have this perfectly pure relationship uh, that this is the best person in, in my life by miles, that it's completely unconditional, and that um, anything you get um, across that, um, that relationship is incredibly rewarding, and uh, that is a large part of why the, these babies are, um, are, are made so happy by their parents and vice versa. And then the third and final thing, um, and this is sort of quite best illustrated by my favourite short um, clip uh, from the, those field reports that I was collecting. Um, so 
Uh, I asked the parents, like, what's the most memorable incident of, of your baby laughing? Uh, and one mother of like an eight-month-old baby saying, you know, we just uh, we just come out of the swimming baths, and he was uh, standing under the shower uh, with the water falling down on his head, and he was laughing with just pure happiness. Um, and I think that's kind of something which often gets slightly overlooked, that a lot of laughter and a lot of um, the causes of, uh, of this sort of behavior is just simple happiness. Uh, and it, it is simple for a child, it's more complicated for us, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. So um, I'd like to thank all the people who've helped me with this. Uh, Marcus, uh, Charlotte, Enker and Sarah at the back there, um, various other people in the Birkbeck Baby Lab, and of course all the parents and babies who took part. And thank you for listening, and I'll answer any questions you have. do a social smile? When do they smile on demand? Um, and that doesn't happen straight away, that happens quite late on, um, 12 to 18 months old. Um, and like fake laughter, yeah, we can all do that, um, and that, that come, comes later on. So I think um, the aspects of laughter can be learned, but the starting point for it is, is a lot of like uh, things which are, are just just built in from the beginning. Um, I mean, is your question also about whether you could people could become laugh more or? Um, yeah, kind of. Yeah. Because um, you said a laughter can be kind of um, part of the social behavior. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, so so one interesting uh, fit example sort of real world case of that is it something called laughter yoga, I don't know if you've encountered that, which is basically a group of people who get together and just laugh at each other. Uh, it started in, in, a, in a park in India, it's now spread all over the world. And the first time people do that, they find it very, very strange. Um, but very quickly, you sort of get over um, your sort of the feeling of this is fake, and it becomes real laughter. And then the next time they do it, they actually start laughing even faster. And they, Part of that is like getting over a social conditioning of laughing in front of a group of people. Um, and I think yeah, that, that social conditioning aspect yeah, can probably be changed. Um, but yeah, beyond that, I'm not so sure. Marcus, you know, yeah, thanks. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for the very interesting lecture. And the fun we had uh, was uh, going through that. Yeah. The question in relation of the application of the, of the data and where the research is applied. Uh, and uh, we're saying that uh, how the baby laughter project and similar research prospective studies can contribute to better parenting and infant caring. Uh, am I doing your home? Am I doing your home? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, to study that, we, we really need to, uh, to collect, collect more data. So. The, um, the FCC data set perhaps going to tell us something about, well, is, is there more laughter in sort of more stable homes uh, and things like that. Um, at this stage, it's so early that uh, I would sort of want to know what laughter is all about before trying to um, attri apply it to sort of intervention type studies where you're, you're trying to look at what's going on. I want to look at what's going right before I look at what's going wrong. If that makes any sense. So the foundation for uh, prospective studies to work on uh, aspects of laughter, which uh, contribute to better parenting, better bond um, between the children and the infants and the <coughs> carers. So I mean, yeah, I mean, I think there's perhaps there is one clear message you can send to parents that um, that, as I said earlier, laughter is this communicative signal, and that when a baby is laughing, you should pay very close attention and try and you know, give as much to that baby as you can at that point because 
And this is part of what our grant will be about is, do babies learn better um, when they're laughing and um, when they're in that good mood? And if they do, then this sort of supports the idea that you know, laughter is a useful signal to, to help you give the baby what it needs. Um, and you know, we could look at that in a, in a, a lab setting. It would be very difficult to look at it. Uh, and, and so we can tell parents, you know, and hopefully you know, they, they already are wanting to get more out of their laughing babies. Um, but you know, it would be very difficult to apply that as a sort of a, um, an intervention study. Uh, about the tickling, so mm -hmm. thing, what, what do you think is funny or making them laugh? Uh, is it the tickling itself or is it, again, the social context of their participation? Um, so, uh, so one of the other things which is almost as funny as tickling is being about to be tickled. Um, and so uh, the actual tickling itself Certainly, for young babies, is like a, um, a a strong a strong stimulus, but it becomes more social at the point where you get a bit older, and the game is is now I'm coming to tickle you, and the anticipation itself uh, elicits the response. Um, I think you know, and and, and it's interesting that you know, adults, a lot of adults, really hate being tickled. It's um, it's quite become quite a, an aversive stimulus as, as time goes by. Um, one of the most um, sort of visited um, questions and posts on our on our blog is um, somebody who asks, um, "How will a baby? How can I know if my baby doesn't want to be tickled?" Um, and it's like, well, you know, they'll start crying. But this was from someone who, as an adult, you know, he was completely paralysed by being tickled and was unable to fight against it. But it's also funny because we do laugh while hating you. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I imagine that that is partly because it's, you know, it's physiological <coughs> on, on some level, this, this one. Um, one of the more fanciful theories about being tickled is it's you shaking off bugs, that anything ticklish is probably a parasite, and so... The, the basic physical reaction to like your body moving is to remove those. But why that would, whether that laughter is part of that or not, um, you know, that's a bit too much of a just so story. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Oh, yes. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if you think that the tickling itself can be used laughing. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's all wrapped up with giving, um, and what Sylvia so key about um, peekaboo, it's all wrapped up with giving genuine, you know, um, attention and interaction with the, with the baby, you know, person to person. So one of the things they, they found with studying of, of, of language development, that you learn far more from uh, talking to someone than you do from watching the same amount of ver you know, verbal information on the screen. You know. um, large part of that, I think, is is perhaps it's just you know, you're more um, you're more fired up. Um, I you know I I think laughter is a self-reinforcing thing in some ways. That if there is laughter, it should hopefully you know, draw your attention. I don't think I would encourage people to go out and just try and make the baby laugh all the time just for the sake of it. Um, but, yeah, underlying all of those things is this, the social dynamic behind it, I think, is the really important aspect. I'm just sorry, because yeah. I was just thinking about situations where it wouldn't necessarily be able to give much contact, for example, if a child's looking for a chili and it's, it's looking in age and it's not getting much Mm -hmm. or, you know, stimulation, should I say, um, or perhaps a parent's like a little PND, for example, where it might not be so much, if that was then being used as less laughter and therefore less 
I mean, I, I think that a lot of these things that um, any kind of prescriptiveness in those situations it can actually be counterproductive. When, you, when people have got a problem and they're, they're worried about, to tell them to be doing one thing or another just adds another problem to their, their situation. And, uh, you know, trusting parents to be parents is, is actually probably your, the best starting point for, for a lot of those things. Um, but yeah, there isn't a lot of research which really answers that question. You know. any, any more? Last one. Uh, you said that um, uh, laugh is a very early way of communicating. So I wonder uh, if is it possible to find different parts, patterns of laugh in language disorders in any way, uh, as you can see on pointing or eye gaze, for example. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a good idea, and I, um, uh, I certainly haven't thought about trying to do that yet. I, mean, I don't know if, if people who work with development disorders and know of, if there's any sort of more stereotypical behaviours related to laughter in, in those disorders. Um, but I imagine that you know, when many things are affected, laughter would be one of those. I don't really know. Okay, okay I'd like to thank Casper once again. speakers and thank you for coming and I hope to see some of you at next year's Science Week, the dates of which I have no idea of. <laughs> <laughs>